Sarwat is a principal data engineer at BioAnalytics uh, with over eight years of experience in the tech industry. She has worked with various types of data in different industries, including healthcare, biomedical, retail, and digital media services. Get ready to learn from a seasoned expert with a passion for creative problem solving. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Sarvat Fatima. I have been working with Biom Analytics first as a senior data engineer and then as a principal data engineer for the past four years. And during this time, I've had the opportunity to build over 20 data pipelines in both Python and PySpark. And each of these data pipelines had hundreds of lines of code with over eight plus years of experience in working with diverse data sets from healthcare to neuroimaging, bio biomedical and finance data sets. I am passionate about data and the insights that it brings. So let's just, just dive into today's agenda. First, we will discuss the big picture of healthcare and its impact on the US economy as well as Biome's role in this area. Next, we will dive into the unique challenges faced by Biome when handling the cardiovascular data sets received from its hospitals. After that, I'll sh uh, share our journey of building data pipelines, the lessons learned and the best practices, both generic and specific related to Ascend. And finally, we will end the our presentation with the future outlook of our data pipelines. Did you know that the United States is an outlier when it comes to healthcare spending compared to other high income countries uh, in the world? In 2021, the national health expenditure grew by 2.1% to $4.3 trillion, which amounted for 18.3% of the total GDP. And by 2030, this projected national health expenditure would be 19.6% of the total GDP, which is similar to 2020 when COVID hit. So there's this research conducted by RTI International, which suggests that in 2016, cardiovascular diseases cost America $555 billion. And it is also anticipated that the cost will surge drastically, reaching $1.1 trillion by 2035. So, but why do we really care about these numbers? So there are three reasons for that. First, a healthier workforce is a more productive workforce and the effects of lower productivity on a, on a nation's economic health can be significant in terms of dollar value. Secondly, the cost of healthcare is built into the price of every American product and service. So if the USA can reduce the long-term costs of healthcare, the cost of American products can become more competitive in the global marketplace. And third, as I mentioned before, according to the Commonwealth Fund, US health expenditures are more than twice the average of other countries and about three to four times more than countries like South Korea, New Zealand, and Japan. So we must take measures to reduce these expenses to have a positive impact on both patients and on the overall US economy. So now that we understand the overall objective, let's explore how Biome is contributing to this effort. So Biome develops performance improvement solutions for cardiovascular centers. We offer services and applications to cardiovascular hospitals and teams. Our main objective is to understand their clinical and financial data and help them identify opportunities for improvement by using cost-effective treatment plans for patients. So this benefits hospitals by allowing them to claim the right treatment costs from health insurance providers and avoid going into debt. And additionally, it also helps hospitals improve their ranking in cardiovascular clinical programs. So some of the improvements that we have already made um, are 
as you can see on the screen, I will explain it one by one. So we have helped hospitals reduce bleeding events quite drastically by 69%. So in cardiology, a bleeding event refers to any occurrence of bleeding related to a patient's cardiovascular disease or treatment. So these events can both be mild or severe and can occur spontaneously or as a side effect of, of the treatment, right? So these events can be very a serious concern for patients with cardiovascular diseases as they can increase the risk for acquiring other diseases or leading to the death of the patient. Another important reduction that we have made for our hospitals is decreasing the outpatient length of stay to about 50%. So this includes patients who did not require hospital admission and could have been discharged earlier. And this has saved hospital additional costs and enabled them to use resources for the treatment of patients who truly require it, right? One of the other key priorities for Biome is to help reduce the unnecessary variation in healthcare that hospitals usually experience. So, so this means that if there were two different patients with the same diagnosis, but different treatments, one treatment was more costly and the other treatment was less costly. This is called inconsistency without any valid medical or scientific justification. And it can result into additional costs, which should not have happened if, if the treatment was similar for both the patients, right? So as a result of our efforts, we were able to reduce this unnecessary variation by 35%. Moreover, Biome is also considered as 90% better in terms of performance as compared to other cardiovascular services. So CVSL that is mentioned over here is actually a cardiovascular service line which is used to identify high performing and low performing services and for benchmarking performance against national and regional averages. The last one that we, our team has successfully improved for our hospitals is that we have helped them increase their contribution margin by $6 million. So this accomplishment is significant because it represents the amount of profit that contributes to paying overhead costs. So the contribution margin is basically a difference between the revenue generated by the hospital and the variable costs associated with producing it. So by increasing the contribution margin, we have been able to generate more profit per patient. So this profit can be then used to cover other fixed costs for running any hospitals, such as resources, salaries, or utilities. So now that we have an idea of the impact biome is creating with the cardiovascular data sets, let's take a look at the data sets that we receive from hospitals. So basically, hospitals provide us two different types of data sets. One is the financial data set, and the other one is the clinical data set. And the clinical data set consists of all the characteristics, treatments, and outcomes of cardiac disease patients. The financial data set basically consists of costs related to each of the procedures, services, any of the primary and the secondary diagnosis that the patient had. And the clinical data set, if, if I have to get, categorize the clinical data set, we can say that we have like three different types of data sets. We have cardiac procedures, cardiac conditions, and cardiac devices. So as you can see in the flow diagram, I won't go in, into very much detail about the abbreviations, but I'll give a high-level overview of these terms. So PCI is basically a cardiac procedure, which is... Um, used to unblock the arteries in heart. And TVT is another procedure which uh, restores the blood flow from heart to other parts of the body. And similarly, there are like these three conditions. AFib is related with irregular heartbeats. CPMI is again a heart condition which is related with pain inside of heart and, and it can lead to heart attack or angina. And stroke is basically when 
blood flow is cut off from heart to brain, then patients go into stroke. So devices, under devices, we have ICD and LAO. So ICD is basically a cardiac uh, implantable device, which regulates dangerously slow heartbeats. And LAO again is related with heartbeats. So if you have irregular heartbeats, there's a chance that the patient can go into stroke. So LAO helps regulate that heartbeat. If we further drill down in our data set, there are different types of information that are information that are available with each of these financial and clinical data sets. So they can be categorized as you know demographics, which includes patients' age, gender, medical history, health risks, and we have procedures, diagnosis, um, and all the all the different drugs or any results between during before or after any procedure right also we also have cost related information with all of these items services or implants and then we have some devices related information as well specifically related to the its utilization their different types and characteristics right and all of this information is protected and only accessible within the within the usa because it's very important for Biome to be HIPAA compliant and HIPAA compliant are the set of rules and laws that we have to follow that these laws are basically set by US government and we have to follow those laws. So if we talk about, if we talk a step further about the data processing matrix, so there are over like 2 billion records which are comprising of the financial data set and the, the clinical data set out of which like 1.5 billion is the financial records and 8.3 million are the clinical records moreover we have like 60000 plus 60000 data points and we have used these 60000 fields to curate around 6000 of the transformations and since we are hipaa compliant we cannot have one single data pipeline for all the clients. So we need to have separate data pipelines. We cannot merge patients from one hospital to another hospital. We need to have separate data pipelines for each of the admin and the clinical data set. So that makes a total of 70 plus data pipelines. And this number is expected to increase as the number of clients increases, right? So typically hospitals require two to six data pipelines each and the pipelines need to be executed monthly since we receive and process data on a monthly basis. So now we have some understanding of the type of data we receive and its data processing metrics. Let's take a look at building these data pipelines. So for understanding our data pipeline journey, it's very important to understand the history of it, right? So our initial data pipelines were written in SQL. So all the data mapping configurations were stored in SQL tables and huge SQL scripts for each of the admin, the financial and the clinical data sets. So all of this code was in one big repository with no proper structure and way to ensure that the production code was bug free. While it worked for a while, as the amount of data increased, so did the execution time, right? That's when we decided to migrate from SQL to Python. And around the same time, we also made some infrastructure changes. For example, transitioning from SVN to GitLab as our primary version control tool, creating our own PyP server for our internal packages, and setting up Azure Container Registry to host our images. So we restructured the code from SQL and separated it out in separate code repositories for each of the financial and the clinical data sets. And during the migration, we also realized that there were many common transformations that could have been housed in a single repository and used as a package in all the other data pipelines. So in Python version one, we used batch processing. So where each batch was extracted from a, a table, processed, and loaded back into the table. So this incurred the network cost. 
And so in order to remove these network costs in Python version V2, uh, we replaced the intermediate processing batches with parquet storage option and loaded the table once into the database instead of loading it with every batch. So this significantly improved the processing time. However, as the amount of data continued to increase, processing time was also increased. And so we decided to move to big data processing and migrate our pipelines to Spark using Ascent. So this allowed us to focus more on business logic instead of orchestration metrics and scheduling. So Ascent was already providing that to us, but previously we had tried another very popular open source solution for orchestration and metrics and scheduling, but uh, it turns out that the management cost was huge with that and there were, there were no visible be benefits because we actually ended up with more problems than solutions. So, so this is like a, a brief overview of our data pipelines journey. So today we will discuss the last portion of this pipeline journey of how we are using Ascend to automate our data pipelines. So typically there are like two ways to develop on Ascend. So it's either UI first or SDK first, right? So if we have, we have tried both methods, each has its own pros and cons. So for a pipeline that is only executed once, we tried UI first development. However, for our particular data pipelines, which are executed on multiple clients and multiple clinical data sets, we opted for SDK first development. So there are two components for our data pipelines on Ascent. One is to leverage the CI CD pipeline for the deployment of Ascent data flows. And the second one is to use design patterns and Ascend SDK to enhance the overall functionality of our data flows. So moving on to the first part of our CI CD pipeline. So in our CI CD pipeline, the first stage is basically static code testing and unit testing. And then the next stage is to build a Docker image based off on the Docker file. And this basically contains some data mapping configurations in YML and also some of the internal packages. And then this Docker image is published on Azure Container Registry so that we can use this image on Ascent. After that, we have like two different ways to deploy our data flows, right? So one of the so one of the stage is to deploy via variables and the other one is to deploy via, via tags. So the other deployment via tags actually follows our two week sprint release cycle during which we tag any development done and update the data flow with the updated code. So the, the other one is our ad hoc deployment of data flow, which occurs if you want to run data flow on a particular date with the data received up to that date without refreshing data. So this ad hoc data flow dumps data into a staging database with a date identifier. We noticed that most of the time there's no need for ad hoc deployment except for maybe debugging purposes or when it is necessary to maintain a specific version of data flow with a particular data version, right? So as you can see in this next slide, I have this screenshot and here we have actually deployed a data flow via a tag. So this tag basically deploys the data flow for all the clients that we wanted the data flow to, ha to have on Ascent. So let's now talk about the design patterns and Ascent SDK and how we used it. So I usually think of Ascend as like a Lego set where various pieces can be arranged to create a complete data flow, right? So this allows for component swapping based on different requirements. So we, so we chose to use this builder design pattern, which is very similar to, to what Ascend is doing, right? So our, all of our Spark pipelines are based on this builder design pattern. 
and it makes use of the Ascend SDK. So our pipelines are automatically deployed by our GitLab as I have mentioned in the previous slide. And if I go in details for this design pattern, so you have this uh, iBuilder class, which basically defines the interface or the construction steps for the pipeline. So such as the read connectors, the transform components and the write connectors, which are present in our, in Ascend as well. And the configurations are basic and, and there are like a set of configurations which which are present in the YAML file. And these configurations are related to these components or there are environment-based configurations. Then we have this builder class, which actually implements each of these construction steps that were present in the interface class. And then based on how many data marts we need, we have different creator class. So each data mart would have its own creator class and a configuration in YAML. And together, they will combine different steps from the builder uh, to create the specific data flow for that particular data mart. And all of these data marts would then combine in the pipeline class. And this will actually create, define the final definition for data flow, which is then given to the Ascend SDK's data flow applier method. And it can deploy the method to, to Ascend. So this is, as you can see, this is one instance of our data flow. We can have, we have some data flows which are even more complicated than this data flow, but you can see how different things are connected and all of this is deployed using Ascend SDK and CI-CD pipeline. So why did we choose this design? we already had common code between the data pipelines. And since we have multiple data pipelines, it made sense to separate the Ascend SDK code and use it as a common code instead of repeating the downloaded code from the UI in each repository, right? So if Ascend decides to significantly update their Ascend SDK code, we can simply go and update a single code repository instead of updating at multiple places. Since we had to migrate um, several data pipelines from Python to PySpark, it made sense to focus more on the business logic and PySpark rather than also dealing with the Ascend SDK code. So it, it also improved the overall engineering productivity. And Ascend SDK has some additional features that are very useful for automating our data flows, such as I, we can dynamically create connections and remove any previous data flows if required, right? So it made the overall experience for automatically deploying the data flow quite easier with the CI-CD pipeline. So I hope you understand till now the data set, the data pipeline building process. So let's now discuss some of the general best practices that we have adopted and learned ourselves during this whole journey. So the first thing is that it's very important to have a very clear understanding of your migration purpose. So whatever business requirements you have, you need to first translate into a technical requirements and then go from there. So for example, for us, one of our business requirements was to expand our client base, right? And this translated into our technical requirements as speed and modularity and we have used ascend and a spark to improve our speed and we have used design patterns to bring in modularity into our data pipelines again design patterns are really important you should try to utilize them there are many tools available out there which can help you orchestrate data pipelines but actually the real value lies in combining all these software engineering skills with these tools to build an effective and efficient data pipeline. Another thing is to create generic CI-CD pipelines. This is very important because if you want to enforce a certain habit among your engineers or anyone who is creating code repositories, it's very important to have these pipelines set up. So for example, for us, it was very important 
that you have each code repository have unit tests, right? So it was already a stage in our CI/CD pipeline. So when we standardized that CI/CD pipeline template, everyone who created a code repository they had to build unit tests with the code so that the pipeline passes and they could merge the code to the master branch, right? So again, unit testing is really important and it's non-negotiable. You should try to have test cases for each of your transformations so that you can make sure that the business logic is expected, is working as expected, and there's there, there are no errors or bugs in that code. Also, unit tests really help as an important documentation tool as well, because it provides a very clear and concise overview of the functionality of the clinical definition. So usually in data companies, multiple teams usually work together and the data you use often comes from another team, right? So therefore it is very crucial to analyze the data types and the sparsity of the data sets and implement any necessary changes either on the upstream systems or within your own code. So additionally, you must ensure that your code output can be easily consumed by downstream systems as well without causing them any issues. So let's discuss some of the best practices that we had noticed or learned while working with Ascent. So always choose one path for development. It's either UI development or SDK development. If you would combine these two, you may end up uh, having some kind of weird, weird errors. So for example, there was like one production data flow we created some data fields manually, but then when, when we tried to deploy through SDK, it gave an error to us because SDK, the code didn't have that, those uh, definitions for data fields, right? So it's very important to use one type of development. Another thing is that if you are using data fields from different data flows, and these data flows are present in different data services, it will add an additional complexity uh, on top of using the data fields, right? So for example, if there are two data services and the developer or the or the data flow does not have access to that data service, it cannot use the data feed from it. So if you are using data feeds from different data flows, so it's best to have them both housed in one single data service. Another thing is to prefer using data feeds or packet storage instead of databases. So Ascend does offer the SQL connector to dump tables in databases, but then you don't have any control over the specific data type. So if your requirement is to have a specific data type for your, for your fields in the table, it's best to use some other method because, because we did try to have like alter statements to improve, to change the data types but then it also added some additional execution time as well. Another thing is sometimes it does happen that, for example, you are deploying a data flow and it's only for the purpose of executing on some new data set and it's like a state dated data flow as well, right? So it may happen that Ascend does not detect any change and it picks up the previous data state. So whenever you have all deployed your data flow via SDK, try to refresh the read connectors right after deployment. So it shows that the new data comes in and the new pipeline is executed. Also, if you are deploying multiple data flows and each data flow needs to dump data into a new database that was created during deployment. So you can use Ascend SDK to create the dynamic read connectors. And we, we use it most, mostly for the ad hoc deployments when creating the dated staging databases. So other best practices could be to properly name your data flows, avoid using the keyword ascend in user names and connections. Also delete unused connections or previous data flows if no longer required. So within ascend SDK, you have this option of dynamically deleting these data flows based on the number of days or how many previous days you want to keep this, keep a specific data flow in your send environment. 
and if you have a transform component and you have some transformations that significantly changes the data schema uh, it's best to just split that transform component into two because you will run into infer schema issues there is a way to correct that you you can define the schema in the infer schema method but if you have like hundreds and thousands of fields it's not very feasible so it's best to just split the transform components and use one type of a schema or maybe just optimize your code another thing is that sometimes again with my one of the my previous points sometimes there are some weird errors with data types and the data types not being matched and there is no possible cause for it so it check the check if ascend has actually executed the data pipeline with a specific job id so it has assigned a new job id otherwise there may be some weird errors and ascend may not may have just picked up the previous state of the data so if you want to refresh that job id make sure that you have like updated code updated code version or updated image version okay so lessons learned so far one of the lessons that we have learned along our journey of building these data pipelines is that before using any tool take the time to evaluate its suitability with respect to your specific requirement so create a proof of concept plan that covers your needs and include the success criteria and only after achieving that success criteria should should you decide to use that tool right so we learned this the hard way we wasted some time and energy on a tool that created more problems for us than giving us solutions so it's like an important lesson there another important lesson is to leave code better than you found it continuously i create and improve it so data pipeline teams are often pressured to drive results which can lead to technical debt to avoid this it is a good idea to include maintenance tasks in your daily to dos or in your daily like or, or in your like sprint planning meeting right and uh, again with the same point try to don't just try to fit your system into existing architecture consider making improvements to both the upstream and the downstream system even if they are small so you will end up with better architecture if you keep adding these improvements into your system okay so the future outlook the future outlook for our data pipeline definitely includes to make further improvements for the scaling and optimization of these data pipelines and then we also want to integrate the event driven architecture with an ascend so that we can capture and respond to any relevant events also we will we, we are looking forward to moving towards a more scalable option such as azure azure sql and remove our dependency on relational databases as much as possible all right so thank you very much Sarwat, for your insights, a lot of great information. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with our audience. That was greatly appreciated. So with that, um, one of the things I guess I should note before that, I've been working pretty closely with uh, Biome an uh, Analytics over the past few months. They have a great data team. I've enjoyed working with them and kind of seeing and learning about their business, but kind of seeing how they work and some of the great things they're doing. So it's been fantastic. Biome Analytics is headquartered in San Francisco, California, and you can learn more about them on their website at biome.io. That's B-I-O-M-E dot I-O. And you can check out some more information there.